Okay, it's a pretty open-ended question, so let me give you a specific scenario. You're playing a tactical shooter like Valorant, when you turn a corner and all of a sudden you find yourself face to face with an opponent who sees you at the exact same time that you see them. Obviously, the goal here is to shoot your opponent in the head before they shoot you. But here's a question for you. Should your aim prioritize speed or accuracy? This is a real trade-off. Every extra millisecond you give yourself to land your shot increases your odds of hitting. But in a PvP situation where it's a race to see who can land a shot first, the question becomes, is that extra time worth it? The short answer is yes. So congratulations to the 69% of you who preferred accuracy over speed. But the long answer is this chart. So allow me to explain. Consider the following scenario. A fair fight between two players in which both players aim for a headshot, both players are standing still, and each player chooses how accurately they want to shoot before they take aim. If we were to calculate the probabilities of each player winning, there would be three possible outcomes. The faster player shoots first and hits, winning the fight. The faster player shoots first, misses, and then gets shot by the slower player, or both players simply miss. The first two outcomes are easy enough to calculate using probability since we already know what accuracy each player is opting for, and we already know that the more accurate player is going to be the slower one. The third outcome is a bit trickier though, because neither player wins nor loses, but it behooves us to resolve those ties. We can reset the fight when a draw like this happens, but it does result in some infinite recursion, where a fraction of the draws then get reset and result in more draws, and a fraction of those draws results in even more draws. Lucky for us, what I just described turns out to be a geometric series, which can be solved using a tidy little formula. Cool. We now know what every possible outcome in this duel is, and how often each player wins during each outcome. The only thing left to do is to tally all of these probabilities up, and by doing so, we can now start to answer how well different accuracies fare against one another. Does very fast beat very slow? Does kind of slow beat kind of fast? What about when both players opt for either end of the spectrum? If we work out these probabilities across a grid of accuracies, we can now calculate how often each accuracy beats every other accuracy, and after applying a color scale, you end up with the chart I showed you a minute ago. The y-axis is the player whose win rate we've calculated for, the x-axis is their opponent, and the color of each cell is the win rate itself. Sure enough, we find that at lower accuracies, things don't look great, with the majority of accuracies below 50% strictly losing to accuracies above them. In my opinion, this is already enough to conclude that accuracy is a higher priority than speed. But I don't know, there's something that bugs me about how we came up with this chart. And after thinking about it for a bit, here's the reason I came up with for why. When we go with this probability-based approach for things, at least how I went about it, we end up treating things as being ordinal rather than continuous. In other words, time becomes about if someone is faster rather than how much someone is faster by. In the cases where either player's first shot hits, this distinction doesn't really matter. The fight has ended, and it doesn't matter if the winning player edged out their victory by a thin margin or by a mile. But in the case where both players miss their initial shots, we have no way of knowing how long each shot took or where it landed. Before, we dealt with this by simply resetting the fight, but that's quite unrealistic, isn't it? In an actual aim duel, you and your opponent don't snap back into place upon missing and try again. You pick up where you left off and keep shooting. So let's try to solve this problem one more time. Only this time around, we'll aim for realism. And in order to do that, we're going to make a simulation. The plan is simple. I create two players, Arlo and Beppis, and I tell them how accurately they should try to aim. I make Arlo and Beppis shoot at each other, and I don't reset the fight until someone gets hit. Once I can do that, I put Arlo and Beppis inside of a box, clone the box 10,000 times, maybe clone those clones another 400 times, and then we get to see what actually happens. The hard part here is this second step. We were missing time in our last approach, so how are we going to introduce time into our simulation this uh, time? 
Well, it turns out that the act of human pointing is so rigorously tested that we actually have a scientific law for it, known as Fitz's Law. The important part of Fitz's Law to us is this first term here, MT, which represents the amount of time it takes to aim at a target. As long as we can plug in values for all these variables on the other side of the equation, we can get our science-approved time estimate. Calculating MT is at the crux of how we will make our simulation work. On the right here, we have the most interesting part of Fitz's Law, the inverse relationship between D, the distance we are from our target, and W, the width of our target, which asserts that the amount of time it takes to aim increases as distance from a target increases and decreases as a target grows wider. Finally, in the middle, we have the two constants which help us tune Fitz's law based on the context it's being applied to, with A representing delay, in our case reaction time, and B representing acceleration, which in our case is the aiming ability of an individual. All five of these variables can be derived from real-life aim examples by hand measuring distances, counting frames, and solving for the remaining variable, something I did to get realistic values for average, professional, and beginner players. But there's one problem with Fitz's Law that we need to fix before we move forward, because there's no point in using Fitz's Law until we address it. When Fitz's Law solves for MT, it's solving for how long it would take to aim if the player expects to hit their target 100% of the time. But we want to solve for any accuracy, not just a guaranteed shot. So to remedy this, we're going to introduce one small change that will help us reach what we're looking for. In the standard form of Fitz's Law, what we model is the time it takes a pointer to reach its target every time. But where exactly that pointer lands can be anywhere within the full range of the target. Most of the time, the pointer will land near the center, but occasionally we might find ourselves closer to the edges. In fact, we can pretty reasonably assume that where we land on the target will be normally distributed. In other words, it will look like this. If we were to then ask a player to aim not at their target, but rather at an invisible region surrounding their target, we can then see that as the normal distribution stretches to cover the full range of this new aim region, the area under its curve begins to overlap less and less with the width of the original target. As it turns out, the amount of overlap between the normal distribution and the target width is the accuracy of the shot. 50% overlap means that 50% of shots will hit. And so all we have to do to introduce accuracy into our calculation is to stretch this aim region enough to match our desired accuracy, which can be done with a bit of calculus or a C table. Returning back to Fitz's law, we can now substitute W with our newly accuracy adjusted width, W of accuracy, and just like that, we're ready to start simulating. In summary, unlike our probability-based approach, our simulation approach now accounts for realistic aiming times, reaction times, aim abilities, crosshair placements, and most importantly, realistic accuracies. The code itself is just plumbing to move data from one place to the next, but once you've got it all up and running, you get this. Now for the fun part actually diving in and making sense of what's going on here. At first glance, this new chart might look nearly identical to our previous chart, and indeed, the two are quite similar. In my eyes, this is actually a good thing though, as two different paths converging onto the same destination helps affirm that we're on the right track. But we've also made some progress as well, because this time around, we can tweak our simulations and see what happens when we change things like aim abilities, target distances and widths, reaction times, or even imbalances of the three. There are a lot of ways we could go about investigating these results, but today I want to take a look at three defining features that I found while looking over various different charts. The abyss, the valley, and the field. So without further ado, let's take a look and dive in. The abyss is where decent aim goes to die. As we noted during our probability-based solution, the abyss is the region of the chart where an accuracy level holds a losing record against the accuracies above it. Depending on how strict you are with this definition, the abyss for average players begins somewhere below the 50% mark and stretches all the way down to zero. 
It's interesting to point out that while the size of the abyss in the probability-based chart is roughly equivalent to the size of our abyss for average players here, this does not hold true at all skill levels. For beginners, we see that the abyss shrinks considerably. Take a look over here. What would usually be a reckless 25% accurate shot fares surprisingly well against a highly accurate 90% shot. Beginners manage a win rate that's just below a 50-50 fight, while the same scenario for average players wins nearly half as often. And weirdly enough, I found that the abyss doesn't seem to shrink uniformly, and instead we find that this subtle fin starts to emerge. I suspect that this roughly indicates the threshold for when a faster player can occasionally sneak in a second shot while their opponent is steadying their aim. But to be honest, I'm not quite sure about that theory. Regardless, accuracy is clearly less important the worse your aiming ability is. And conversely, at the professional level, more important the better your aiming ability is. Of course, that doesn't mean that the highest accuracies are the best. And so to demonstrate that, let's now take a look at the upper left-hand corner of the chart, an area that I call the valley. The valley is represented by these steep hills along our chart's diagonal line of symmetry, and its geography helps demonstrate the fickle nature of undercutting. By simply crossing this threshold from left to right, an accuracy that was once very winning can suddenly become very losing after just a small change from our opponent. Why this happens is actually quite easily explained. As we've noted earlier, it doesn't matter if you win by a hair or by a mile. As long as you hit first at all, you're chilling. And in the case of highly accurate shots, it turns out that a small compromise in accuracy can be all it takes to get that edge in speed. If your opponent opts for a 100% accurate shot, you can undercut them with a 95% accurate shot. And similarly slow, they can undercut you with a 90% accurate shot and you can continue to do the same with 85%. Eventually, this undercutting strategy stops working as well once sacrifices in accuracy start to significantly undermine the value of being faster. But the existence of this effect at the higher accuracies puts a soft upper bound on just how accurate you should be. At lower skill levels, the hills of the valley become much steeper. But at professional skill levels, the valley stops looking much like a valley at all. This is the result of natural variance in reaction times, accounted for in my implementation of the simulation. At higher levels of play where aim duels are tighter, even small amounts of variance are enough to blend outcomes together, while at lower levels of play, a realistic amount of variance in reaction time isn't enough to fully mitigate the effects of undercutting. But this variance doesn't just impact the valley. It also helps pave the way for the last, and I would argue most important, feature of the aim grid. The feel. If the abyss is where our porridge is too hot and the valley is where our porridge is too cold, the field is where things are just right. It's really nothing too flashy. The field is, well, flat, and while it may be rockier and smaller at the lower skill levels, it becomes much wider once you reach professional levels of play. And that flatness presents us with an opportunity to find genuinely fair fights. The nice thing about the field is that if your opponent aims about as accurately as you do, you're both on even ground. And honestly, what more could you ask for in a scenario where you're both evenly matched with no external advantages in either direction? But if your opponent decides to either overshoot or undershoot the field to try and find a sneaky advantage somewhere, they're liable to end up in either the abyss or find themselves undercut in the valley. And while there are small pockets of opportunity where a shot aimed at the field is vulnerable to slightly unfavorable outcomes, aiming around these accuracies is about as close as you'll get to a foolproof strategy. In fact, at the professional level, it nearly is one. The implication here is, in my opinion, pretty good news. It means that when it comes to aim duels, you'll find that you have much more say in how things go than your opponent does. While the more extreme ends of aiming accuracy are vulnerable to weird gotchas that can leave you in a bad spot, the field is comparably serene and durable to unusual tactics. Interesting enough, while I found that professional players almost always seem to opt for accuracies that indeed place most of their encounters in this area of optimality, the same does not really hold true for average and beginner players, who have a greater tendency to go for high-speed flicks that can often land them in the abyss. So, if I were you, I'd try to hang around at least the 65% mark, and aim to steadily raise that accuracy level as you improve. 
But ultimately, this video isn't really aim advice at all. And if it is, it's aim advice for a pretty specific scenario that, you know, maybe I didn't even simulate correctly. By the way, please let me know if you found any mistakes. No, this video is just about me indulging in a question that's been on my mind for a while now. Because sometimes you just seem to scratch that itch. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Shoutouts to my patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching.